Good day, my friends. In today's vlog, I share a railroad story with you, and in the process, I have to stop at the beginning of the video and explain just a little bit to you on how air brakes work to give you a better understanding of what my story is all about. Bear with me here, friends. Good day, dude. I thought I'd sit here on the porch and tell you a little railroad story today. It depends on how much traffic noise we're going to have to listen to here. For some reason, sitting on this porch is like being in a, a speaker house and all the sound just comes whipping right up the hill. The only thing that aggravates me about making a video out here is the traffic noise. But I thought I'd share a little railroad story today. And in order to tell you the story, I should interrupt the video just a little bit to tell you something about how air brakes work on a rail car and you might better understand the story um, as I tell it. So I'll have to do some narration on the understanding air brakes in a separate video that I'll insert right here. Good day viewers, Walter here. To better understand today's video, which is a railroad story, I wanted to spend a few minutes discussing how a train brakes work on a rail car. We'll begin by, let's see, let's go to my pictures. Here we're looking at a typical brake system a standard brake system on a rail car and I basically want to explain how the air brakes work to better understand my story. I could go into great detail uh, and make it downright boring but basically I'm just going to give you the basics here. You can see by my cursor here there's one, two, three, four brake beams all connected with levers and rods and connection points so basically the weight almost all brake rods right here you see a brake rod going from this lever to this lever uh, there's brake rods on both ends they go from brake levers to brake levers uh, this automatic slack adjuster they used to be just straight brake rod not all cars have this automatic slack adjuster and you've got the cylinder lever here. It's connected to the top rod right here, which goes to the top of the lever. So basically to understand how brakes work, let's look at another picture. Okay, imagine if you will, there's one, two, three, four wheels on that end of the car. One, two, three, four wheels on this end of the car. Right here on the end of the brake beam is where the brake shoes are. When you apply the brakes, the brake shoe just pulls right up against the wheel, scrubs it real tight to stop the, to apply the brakes. And I just added these red circles here to give you an idea about where the wheels are. Let's go back to this picture. Now, you see the brake piston this is a standard arrangement. There's various types of brake rigging and arrangements uh, more than I could explain to you in one sitting here. This is the basic arrangement. Now this brake piston is attached to the underside of the rail car or sometimes up on the center sill, various locations. But basically what you got is a big piston that comes in and out. That piston can travel out approximately 12 inches. And it's got a big heavy-duty rod stuck in it. And it's the only rod on the, the brake system that actually pushes instead of pulls. All these other brake rods pull. They pull a lever. So let's, take, let's start right here on this brake beam. This is a dead lever. It's attached to the brake beam. In the middle is attached to a bottom rod. And the top is actually attached to the car body, so that's a dead lever. It ain't going nowhere. It's attached there permanent. So 
it doesn't, it just pivots is all it does. So let's go back over to the piston. If you're using air brakes, the air brakes are applied, causes the air to come out, push the piston out. It pushes the piston out a standard brake distance on most standard brake cars is seven to nine inches. There's got to be a little slack in there uh, when the piston comes out of the brakes would stay stuck up against the wheels at all times. So until such time as that piston pushes out to take up all the slack, the brakes don't actually scrub on the wheels. So when the piston comes out, it pushes on the push rod right here pushes this lever, the cylinder lever, this direction, which in turn on the other end of the lever pulls on the top rod that runs down to the end of the car. When you pull on that top rod, it pulls on this live lever and pivots on this bottom rod. So if you pull on that, it makes the brake beam, both brake beams, scrub up against the wheels. It's got a certain amount of travel in this live lever. It could only physically go about this angle right here. So you got seven to nine inches of piston travel to make the brakes apply. That leaves a short period of time till it would be pushing dead. This piston can only go out about 12 inches. Now if there is no air brakes, you see a chain right here. This chain goes down the length of the car and comes up to the handbrake. When somebody winds up a handbrake, you don't need any air on it. It actually pulls the push rod out, pulling the brake lever, and then turn, pulling the top lever, and pulling the brake shoes up against the wheel. So simply winding up that chain around the handbrake, which is all a handbrake is, is basically a winch. And it winches the brakes, pulls, and just basically winches up tight and makes the brakes apply. So if I wanted to wind up the handbrake, it would make the brakes come up against the wheel and the car couldn't easily roll. You could drag it with a locomotive while the brakes are still on there, but the wheels are just going to slide. It ain't going to roll free. And if you're using air brakes, then just the air coming in and out. Nowadays, they have an automatic slack adjuster, which will take up the slack from and make it stay within, say the, the brake shoes were getting worn out. With that automatic slack adjuster, it will take up some of the travel and make sure that your piston stays between seven and nine inches thereby making the brakes quite functionable without that slack adjuster or if it's defective. The length will change and the brakes will not work properly. That's just a basic understanding. I could go into far more detail, but I don't want this video to be too long. To give you an idea uh, basically how the brakes work in order to understand the story that I'm about to relate to you. Now, I was a railway carman for a good 34, 35 years. I would have lasted longer had I not got the injury. It tore out my rotor cuff in my shoulder and completely tore my rotor cuff in half, falling down the basement steps of all places. I couldn't get hurt at work. I had to get hurt at home. But I don't want to drag this story out too long. Anyway, I worked as a railway carman for 34 years, 35 years, right at it. And after I had worked in Atlanta, I worked possibly every job you can think of as a railway carman. I became quite proficient in my job. I was a union employee, the Brotherhood of Railway Carmen of the United States in Canada. Um, in order to work for the railroad, you got to be a contract employee, a union man. You cannot work for the railroad. Well, you couldn't back then. I guess it's still the same way. You 
if you didn't join the union, you didn't get to stay and work for them. It's like what they call a, a closed shop. So after 15 years and 16 years, something like that, working almost every job you can get, work and understand carman work in Atlanta, I became quite proficient as a carman. Uh, I worked on the repair track where you repair cars and trains. I understand very well how the mechanics of a real car uh, function. I've worked in the yards inspecting trains, looking for defects. Um, worked out on the road, traveling to different places, repairing cars, going to train derailments. I worked on the Atlanta Derrick for several years, five or six years, off and on. Actually, it was more than that, but I was a member of the crew for five or six years. I went to a lot of derailments with the railroad, and usually when you go to a derailment, the company officials will show up from everywhere. You got a bunch of college boys working for the company, and uh, somehow when they go to college, they think, I guess they brainwash them at college, that you're smarter than anybody else. They never consider there's thousands of people out there with much higher intelligence than they have working everyday ordinary jobs. Um, just because you go to college don't make you smart. Make you book smart, I guess, is what some people will say. Well, uh, there's plenty of people that you might look down on that you're smarter than. Um, they are three times as intelligent as you are, even if you did go to college. But what I was trying to point out was when the company hires somebody with a college education, they'll usually give them uh, a company position like a general foreman or road foreman or a train master, they give them some kind of title. And officers of the company usually get promoted up to those ranks. If you're a union employee, don't look good. Occasionally somebody would be made a foreman and a general foreman out of the ranks. But lately, they think you gotta have some kind of college degree. Anyway, when you go to a train derailment, I digress. First thing they do is swarm in and try to figure out what caused the train derailment. I'm into many a train derailment where we could spend a, a whole day just getting the cars back up on the track and they decide, well, we got to figure out what caused this derailment. I've been one, well, several derailments where they, let's just back up the train and shove it through here again and see what happens. So they get the train all put together, comes shoving up. I said, don't do that. Any common fool can tell you it's going to derail again right here in the same spot. Well, the college boys said, no, we got to know what happened. We, somebody in our department had already told them what the cause of the derail was, but they got to prove it. What it boils down to is they don't want to, the derailment to be on their department, like a mechanical defect. Uh, different causes of a train derailment might be a, a switchman not properly lining a switch or making an illegal move going the wrong way or something. Um, doing something stupid that would have caused the derailment. But that ain't the cause of all derailments. Sometimes it's a mechanical problem or a problem with the track. Sometimes the tracks will get loose, the spikes will get loose, the cross ties will get play in them from the wood rotting and the track will spread apart and the truck and the train will drop in. There's hundreds of causes for derailments. And they got to know precisely what caused the derailment. The story today is in regards to the cause of a derailment in a way. After I'd been there 15 years ago, they sent me a, a bid on a job down here in Griffin. I'm working an outline point under the Columbus Division. I'm the only railway carman for 100 miles. 
I was in charge of the whole central Georgia territory um, from Macon, almost to Macon, down to Smart, Georgia, all the way up to Cedartown, Georgia, and um, later on north to Atlanta. That wasn't central Georgia territory, that was Carmen territory. But like I say, I was quite proficient in the mechanics of it derailments and stuff and no one usually figured out what might have happened. So I'm working one day down in Smart, Georgia. They have a lot of timber forest product companies down that way. And I can't remember the name right off hand. Southern Forest, one of those companies. But it's a place with five or six tracks. They shove these wood big old giant chip hoppers up there and load them with wood chips. It's like a big huge sawmill and they grind up whole pine trees and make a huge pile of wood chips out there and they load all these chips into these wood chip hoppers. As a result you got all these earth moving machines driving back and forth across the track and dirt's piled up yay high. Wood chips are everywhere. There's no really ground. You can't walk around without walking on wood chips. Just in, barely, you know, you could see the top of the rail where they've been shoving back and forth. And they had a woman operate this big earth machine, I forget her name, but she was quite proficient. She pretty well run that show down there in Southern Forest. And um, they had a derailment one evening by four or five o'clock. I got a call on the radio to come down there dispatcher or somebody called me. I went down there. When it's a derailment, usually a general foreman or a train master or some company official will show up. Somebody from the mechanical department would often show up. It wasn't my job to call and report derailments. They called and told me. So the dispatcher whoever is reporting it, it's their job to call these various departments to come to the derailment. And I was hour or two away I finally got there. And what had happened, one of the chip hoppers had rolled down through the derail and jumped right off the track and they're intentionally derailed so the car won't get out on the main line. Well, I, I looked and called on the radio. Nobody was coming, no train masters or nothing. Just getting on five or six o'clock in the evening, it's gonna be dark pretty soon. Well, I guess I better see what I can do about re-reeling this thing myself. There's no locomotive here. Sometime during the night, a locomotive will come to Southern Forest and pick up all the loaded chip hoppers, switch them out, get them all lined up to go and take them south to Macon, where they would be put into other outbound trains going different parts of the country. Just a little local train that comes up there. Well. I went over there and found that woman. It's a big, huge, earth-moving type machine that moves them wood chips around. It's huge. I mean, you can, that thing's got all kind of power. I said, you think you can pull that chip hopper back up the hill here if I get it back on the track? We'll sure give it a try, she said. I had a big steel cable on the, on the back of my truck and some big hooks. I hooked that up to the chip hopper. Still nobody showed up. Well, I had her pull. We got another machine come over there, a tractor or something. We had two it had chains and everything else pulling. And we're pulling uphill. We pulled that loaded chip hopper right back to the rail. I put some replacers down for re-railing with. In short order, within an hour or so, putting wooden blocks and wedges if I can go on the track. I said, well, pull it on up there past the switch where we can tie it down. Uh, wind up the handbrake, have her slack off on the cable, and when I do, the car just starts rolling again. I said, tighten your cable back up. She held it back up. There's something wrong with these brakes. I'm going to have to inspect it. So she held it real steady and uh, I got to looking around the car. If uh, if by now I've explained how brakes work, 
you might be able to better understand what what happened. But basically, the brake levers will only have so much trouble. A brake lever pivots in the middle. It's only got a certain amount of travel. This one's this bottom half of the lever is pulling on the bottom rod. The top half is hooked to a top rod that's either pushed or pulled by the air brake piston coming out. Well after it travels so far it can't slant anymore in the brake beam. There's a little slot in the number 18 or 20, number 24 brake beams that limits how far them brake levers can travel. Now I look under the car and the brake shoes are wore out. Them cars have two inch composition brake shoes that are about that thick. So if all four shoes were wore out down to a nub like this, when that lever could only pull so far, it can't pull the brake shoes up against the wheels. So I knew right away what it was. The term we used on the shop was pulling dead. The brakes are pulling dead. In other words, it's pulled as far as it can pull. But yet the shoes haven't got up against the wheel yet. Well, I can't get under there and adjust bottom rods and levers in, a, in those conditions. It's not like you're in a shop where you can put a flag up and jack the car up in the air and roll the wheels out and adjust everything. It's got to be another way to do it. I mean, you can climb under there if you want to risk your life and limb, but I wasn't doing it. I have worked under cars many a time when I could chalk the wheels and go under there and work on them. But um, when it's on a downhill slope and there's nothing but wood chips and dirt piled up as high as the rail, there's no room to get under there. You gotta figure another way. I know what I'll do. I'll put four brand new brake shoes on it. I went to my truck and got brake shoes and changed all four of them. Still didn't have quite enough travel. Went to the other end of the car and changed all four brake shoes down there. So I had eight brand new sh brake shoes on that car. And when I did, the lever was straight up and down. It was working perfect. Basically, the top rod should have been a different length when they manufactured that car, rebuilt it, or whatever they had done. So I called the dispatcher and told him the car was repaired. Well, the dispatcher asked me, what caused the derailment? I said, the brakes were pulling dead. It was a mechanical defect, he said. I said, yes, sir, it was. It was a mechanical problem. It wasn't nothing wrong with the track, but people didn't mishandle the car or anything. It wasn't the shipper's fault. So the, this was on, it done got dark by then. The dispatcher went ahead and made his report up the line wherever it goes to on the daily report. But it got, the next morning, I get a call here at home. Did you put a mechanical cause on a derailment as small last night? I know it sure as hell did. You can't do that. Come to the office. I went down there and said, what? Walked in the boss's office. What are you talking about? You cannot put a mechanical cause on a derailment. I don't know why not. I re-railed it. I inspected it. And I know damn well what caused it to derail. You're not a company official. You can't put a cause on a mechanical cause on a derail. I said, well, by George, there wasn't nobody else here to do it. There wasn't no company officials there. Besides, I don't have anything to do with reporting it up the line to the railroad headquarters. Whoever y'all are does that. They wanted to fire me is what it boiled down to. They want to push the blame off on somebody else. Maybe it was a shipping or the shipper caused the derailment. Maybe it was somebody let the brakes off. They had to be some kind of cause, but not a mechanical cause. That's a reflection on the mechanical department. They threatened to fire me. I said, fire me all you want. I'm telling you what happened. I told them, how did you fix it? Well, I said, you don't think I'm gonna climb into that damn car and risk my life with them. I put eight brand new brake shoes on that car and we went out of here with the work 
with a seven inch piston travel, brakes working just fine. Well, they didn't believe me. The car had already been pulled. It was in the train down there and making somewhere, getting ready to go on up the line somewhere. We went and got that car, took it to the repair shop and make it. Put it through all the tests they could find trying to pr prove me wrong. I told them, are you sure about the other brakes were pulling dead? Well, they... They don't want some low-life carman, some stupid carman that don't know Dibley, even if he's been real railing cars 20, 25 years. He didn't go to college. He can't put a cause on a derailment. So what they basically said was they reworded my cause and said the articulation was out of sync. I forget how they worded it but they had to put articulated brakes not functioning properly. Falls down to the brakes were pulling dead and they re-reported it that that was the cause. They didn't really change the cause, they just reworded it. But they had to admit it was a mechanical defect and that was the last I heard of them trying to fire me. I would have took them to the uh, labor board in a heartbeat. fired two or three times during my career, twice during a derailment, but it's just a form of punishment they use. It's not a permanent fire. And you, the only way you get really permanent fired is if you're stealing or drinking or doing drugs or something like that, or, or you're just not a very good employee. But that was the kind of mentality I was dealing with with a railroad. More than once, some foreman would question, uh, question me as to how something was going. And more than once, I've stood up to a foreman or a general foreman and told him to his face, this is the way it is. When you get out there and start repairing cars, you can tell me how to fix something. If I know the proper way to fix something or repair something or what caused something or how to do something, I'll do it. That was just a little story I wanted to share with you on this fire water for putting mechanical cars on the deal. This video might be kind of drawn out. If you like my story or you understand it, you make a comment. I appreciate it. While you're thinking about it, reach down there and click subscribe. I won't complain. It don't cost you nothing. It makes me feel good knowing people get out there and watch my videos. These people all part wishing everybody well. Going to go in the house, the wife is going to make a smoked sausage and um, what is, oh, she's got a pot of pinto beans on the stove with a ham bone in it. I got to go feed the birds real quick. The dove has done come down twice while I've been sitting here talking to the red bird, two red birds out there looking like, where's our food?